when I when I last spoke here, it was probably 30 months ago or so. It was spring in the Arab world. The region was convulsed. The neighbours were nervous, and the rest of us, I think, were bewitched by this extraordinary going on. So it's spring in the Middle East again. This region is still convulsed. Um, I don't think the prospects are quite so positive or optimistic as they were at the time. Um, I guess the thing that summarized my feeling about the period last year was a wonderful photograph of the demonstration in Tel Aviv. The Israeli bloke walking along in the demonstration with a great big banner which said, walk like an Egyptian. <laughs> and to me that sort of summed up the, the optimism at that time. I'm not seeing that sort of, that sort of um, indicator at the moment. I should add that um, I just paid host to a distinguished Egyptian academic and I'm afraid I haven't had time to rewrite my notes because some of the things he said made me sort of stop and think about what I was going to say, but too bad. Um, I think since, the, since that period, since the revolts broke out, and I pushed the revolts way back. And you can go back to 2005 in Egypt and see demonstrations occurring against the corruption and the political manipulation, etc. But since the last 12 or 15 months, We've had one winner, reasonably clear, which is Tunisia. They have problems, but they seem to be managing more reasonably well and they're hearing all the sort of stuff that I guess we would like to hear, tolerance and that sort of thing. Um, otherwise, we have stalemate in Egypt, and we'll get onto this later on, I hope, but uncertainty clouding a whole range of important issues. What is going to happen to Hosni Mubarak? which has great, uh, more than symbolic, but great symbolic importance to the people involved on both sides of the demonstrations. Uh, what is going to happen with the Egyptian constitution? Uh, what is the Muslim Brotherhood going to do? How is it going to, what sort of role is it going to play? And there's uncertainty about all these things uh, building up, I think, as we reach certain crescendos. Um, and of course, the place of women in this regime is also moot. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about that as well, very briefly. It's easier to talk about the losers, I think. Uh, the losers start with the Palestinians. Um, we've seen basically a complete abandonment of whatever peace process there was involving the Palestinians and Israelis. I never really thought there was much to it, but when Obama basically reneged on his promise that there would be a Palestinian state by September 2011, um, where he basically threw up his hands and said, settlements are too hard for us, you go ahead and do what you like. When just a week ago, uh, he supported Israel's attacks on Gaza, even though everybody knew that the basis on which the Israelis were attacking Gaza was false, then it became very clear that the Palestinians are on their own. Uh, and they're quite aware of it and have been commenting on it at the same time. Um, the Bahrainis, 60% of the population, are routinely uh, persecuted by the regime, uh, arrested, uh, all sorts of terrible things, despite the findings of an independent commission inquiry, which basically undermine the arguments of the regime about its concerns about the Iranian threats uh, and the tense moment through the, the regime. Iranians uh, themselves, um, we were talking about this earlier, the Ayatollah Khamenei, Ayatollah Khamenei, the Supreme Leader, is a very much a flawed leader as a Supreme Leader. He is a sort of faux Ayatollah who has struggled for some time to establish his power. I think from 2009 and those elections that took place, he has done a lot to establish his own position and to undermine the power of people like Ahmadinejad, of Sanjani, if you like, and, and some of the other old guard. Um, ironically, this may be an opportunity, and I want to talk about this little quickly later, that for some sort of progress in cutting the tension 
between the United States and Israel and Iran. Uh, because he is now in a position where he feels he can make compromises without showing weakness. Women, generally across the Middle East, I think their position has been deteriorated. Um, in countries like Jordan, where the Constitution has recently been amended to have the word gender taken out of non-discrimination clauses in the Constitution. Uh, Egypt, where, as my visitor was saying today, uh, sexual violence directed at women has been increasing over the past 12 months, even though women have been covering up increasing women. Um, it, it, it's sort of whether it be the West in the 19th century or the Middle East in the 21st, the idea of emerging democracy and rights for women don't seem to be very, very, very comfortable. I think the young people in a lot of these places have lost, at least in the short term, uh, they found themselves outmaneuvered by better organized Muslim brotherhood and groups like that. Um, and I think to an extent the Americans. Now I don't want to overstate this, the Americans, for example, in the Gulf, have very formidable military assets. But I think their position, their political position has been dramatically weakened, first by George Bush, and then secondly by the inconsistencies of the behavior of Obama. After the elation of the, of the Cairo speech, people have sort of moved to the point where they don't trust him. The Israelis don't trust him, the Arabs don't trust him, the Saudis don't trust him. What we're seeing, um, and sort of following up from Colin's sort of introductory remarks, is a, a number of developments running through the region. One of them, I think, is the process where traditional centers of power are starting to fight back, to regroup and fight back against the forces of change. At the heart of those are the Saudis, um, uh, but also Bahrain, the United Arab Emirates. Um, well, the countries that have formally agreed to join the Gulf Cooperation Council, this extraordinary Gulf-based organization that reaches to Morocco. Um, one of the, the things that struck me last year was the way in which all the change, the processes, were affecting every country of the region. For example, with the man with the banner, shows how Israel was, to an extent, influenced. Morocco, right across to Iran, were affected. In those processes, the, one of the issues that I think has been most interesting has been the development of young people standing up and demanding change. Uh, young people who, in all these countries, were desperate, look out and finish their university with their whatever degree it is, look out and they can't even get jobs as a taxi driver. Frustrated beyond all belief of the way the system is working and saying we want to change it. Now, they have lost the first round. The Muslim Brotherhood have clearly outmaneuvered them through superior organization to the extent that the young people were playing that game anyway. Uh, if there's any good news I see in the situation at the moment, I think it is the longer term prospect of these people working their way through the system and forcing change uh, more gradually. The other that I want to touch on, and Dr. Shannon will be talking more specifically about this, is the issue of religion. The, the characteristic has been the, the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood and all the native organizations throughout the region. And this shouldn't be a surprise. When you have 90% of the region Muslim, religion is going to intrude on the politics in certain ways. Um, just as we have in other countries, if you look at the American uh, campaign, electoral campaign at the moment, religion is bouncing around all over the place. We had it in our own DLP. We see it in Christian Democrat parties in Europe. Um, the meaning of what is going on with the Muslim Brotherhood is much less clear. And this is where my speaker today gave me pause for thought. Um, 
there are differences in the, in the various Muslim Brotherhood uh, groups around the region. Uh, but there are some generalizations we can make. One is that they are very effectively organized um, and, and run. One that I find quite interesting is the way they seem to be attracted to neoliberal economic policies. One is that, especially the Egyptian one, middle class professionals and business people seem to be attracted to them. But also that they do have quite diverse memberships. Now, the, the Muslim Brotherhood has a record, a history. Can it change the spots? And again, I'm not so sure what to say about this. My Egyptian colleague was, I think, rather skeptical about it. Um, it could be that what we're seeing is the organization presenting itself as moderate so that it can see, achieve power, but that that's a facade. That's certainly an established principle of the Shia Islam. But um, we also saw it, I think, with, in Algeria with the uh, Islamic Salvation Front uh, 20 years ago. Now, concern or not, there's not much, I think, that we should do about the rise of Islam because it reflects the views of so, such a huge proportion of the population. I also don't think there's much we can do about it. My inclination uh, is that these parties, especially the Egyptian one, which is so big in the, in the current parliament, will be forced to accept the complexity of their societies and will be forced to learn, if they haven't already learned, the, the need to compromise and to gravitate somewhere towards the middle of the spectrum. Or we may see the brotherhood break up into, into different, uh, different parties. And of course, then the issue is of Iran. The, I regard hyperventilating US and Israeli approaches to Iran um, as not being over the bottom, to say. And I gather last week there were doubts about this as well. Um, I think it is widely felt that Iran is not working towards the bomb, although it is working towards the capacity of Iran. And in fact, American Neocons are demanding that the US respond to capacity rather than intent. Um, the issue is, is, the, is the regional power balance. Do we allow the Iranians to assume a hegemonic position in the region? Um, it's been interesting, I think, over the past week with the APAC conference, etc. An element of what I regard as sanity anyway, creeping into the Iran debate from the US side. The comments that Obama made were, were very interesting, and I think put those who want to adopt a more aggressive approach to Iran on the back foot, um, Netanyahu and, and the neocons, or at least the Republicans. Um, we had, for example, a very specific if and slightly ambivalent, acknowledged by Khamenei, the Supreme Leader, of the remarks that Obama made about who was talking about war. This is the sort of thing that we wouldn't have been hearing months before. Um, now, I'm not sure whether we're out of the danger zone, but certainly I think this is a good sign. There's a number of others that I uh, wanted to mention very quickly, which suggest that Obama's policy of diplomacy mixed with sanctions, and sanctions which I do not agree with. But, um, we've had Khamenei issue, reissue this fatwa of 1994 to say that to possess or to build nuclear weapons would be a We've got the Iranian Supreme Court overthrowing a judgment of the death penalty against American Iranian had for a sign for the United States. We had the United States handing back to Iran an arms deal that the Iranians wanted to get their hands on. Um, the former uh, governor of Pennsylvania has been apparently receiving funds from the Mujahideen cult, a um, slightly eccentric uh, terrorist organization, 
a terrorist on any organization that is on the United States list of terrorist organizations. Um, and Chuck Haley, who was a former senator and chairman of Obama's Intelligence Advisory Board, hinting that back channel talks were already underway in talking to the science. So to me, these are good signs. I don't want to make too much of them because there's a big step for the West to make, which is over reprocessing of the uh, nuclear fuels, which the West may not be willing to step to accept. But good signs. Finally, poor old Syria. Um, this is a regime with massive shortcomings, is my question. Uh, what we are seeing, I think, is a number of forces working through the civilian system, which are working to produce, I think, one of the potentially one of the greatest tragedies in the region. Uh, it's caught up in part with the anti Iranian charge led by the Saudis, uh, amongst others. Uh, the Saudis are very much ahead, uh, trying to be the commanders of the Get Assad gang. Um, I don't think we can assume that we said the Saudis are inspired by human rights or the idea of democracy. Uh, but more they're looking at this thing that Colin referred to, this evil arc of Shia running across from Iran to the Mediterranean. Uh, but countries like Iran, Iraq, um, Syria, and Lebanon are increasingly becoming caught up in rivalry between the Saudis and the Iranians. The Saudis also have a personal thing, which is, I think, their little suspicion that Bashar al-Assad was somehow involved in the death of Rafiq Hariri in 2005. We are, to an extent, I think, seeing a struggle in Syria over, it's a continuum, uh, the degree of religiosity in the Syrian political system. So the issue of degrees not absolutes. My view, which people tend not to accept, is that no country in the region is fully, is, is theocratic. Not the Saudis, not the Iranians. They operate on secular bases. Alternatively, I argue that no leader, whether they be of Saudi Arabia or of Nasserus Egypt or Ba'athus Syria is non Muslim. These are all men who would tell you that they are good observant Muslims. We accept that one is another thing. Um, this tension, this stretching of running along the, the continuum is colored by the complexity in Syria of the Muslims. Well, I want to be careful here because the surveys that we've seen, or one survey that we've seen, suggests that Bashar al-Assad still has support of the majority of the population in Syria. Um, I was in uh, Jordan and Lebanon last November and was struck by the number of people who said, we support what Bashar al-Assad is doing. They are scared of the people in Homs and Hanma. These are the men with the big beards and the short dishdashes who are fanatics and they don't want these people to gain power in Syria. Um, he also, of course, then has to deal with his exploiting or whatever, the city of Christian and the other communities, both of which are significant plus not particularly powerful. Um, the other point I'll make if I'm not, is um, what has been going on in Syria over the last week, the bombings of Damascus, the bombing in Lebanon, I think work to the regime's advantage. If you're a Syrian and you see these bombings, and people tell you they're from outside forces, I'm part of a for example, that reinforces the message of the regime, however plausible you may find it. Um, this is a regime, I think, that will not negotiate or at least not from a position where it can be said that we from any weakness. Um, and I can't see the regime fracturing that. So far, the core elements of the regime are holding stable, as far as we can tell. 
So the result is a drawn out more attrition. Um, now, to me, this is an invitation to collective risk smashing, I suppose. Um, the, the, the positives, such as they are, to me, are that the new regime in Egypt, regardless of what it is, I think is going to be better than what we had. And the other one is the longer term prospect of generational change. The people who were standing up in Tahrir Square or in Tehran or wherever actually starting to have some impact on the way the politics is run. Okay, thanks. Um, I'll probably go a little bit micro from uh, Anthony's macro. Uh, and I think it's uh, when you're looking at a region as complex as the Middle East, and when you're looking at the issue of Iran in particular, um, fortunately or unfortunately, fortunately for those people who are interested in those kind of things, you can't get away from uh, the impact of religion and history on the political makeup of the region, and in particular the way the prisms through which people see events. And that's very important to understand. How is somebody else viewing a series of events in the region? Uh, I mean, people within the region look at those events as opposed to people like us from outside looking into prisons. You get a very different view of exactly the same events because people, uh, prisoners have their own upbringing, prisoners have their own education, and prisoners have their own culture. So you do need to understand some of the drivers, which is what I'm going to concentrate a bit on uh, in my talk. Um, so first of all, just so you can put people in the picture, I'll put a few uh, pictures up to prompt um, my discussion. But I'm going to talk about the Sunni Shia divide we've talked about, um, you know, the class of civil, clash of civilizations uh, between modernist uh, Christian West and uh, Islam. Um, but many fewer people talk about uh, the divide within Islam, how that plays in the region. And for mine, um, this is one of the issues that has you know, great import over the last one or two decades, and in my opinion, is going to be an even greater import over the next 10 years. The dark green there, for those people who can see it, is a uh, <coughs> imperfect, but the best I can find, representation of the general layout of the Shia population uh, in the Middle East. Uh, it's oftentimes referred to three branches of Shia Islam, uh, the other two branches which are in uh, Yemen <coughs> and Syria, are uh, really so far removed from uh, mainstream Shiism as to be different religions. Um, so when we talk about mainstream Shiism, we're talking Iran, southern Iraq in particular, uh, large populations in Kuwait, about a third of the population in the Gulf, as Anthony said, 60% of the Bahraini population. Um, and also, um, probably, although there's only been one census in Lebanon, probably the majority population in Lebanon. Uh, and Azerbaijan, uh, I believe. Uh, is there as well. What we see is a tension uh, in the region. The majority um, Sunni uh, Arab population, in particular, sees any advantage political or otherwise gain on the part of Shia populations as one of two things. It's a, a zero-sum game, so any advantage accrued by Shia populations must uh, implicitly come at the expense of Sunni interests. And secondly, there can be no advantage held by uh, Shia because the hand of Persian Iran is behind everything that the Shia Arabs do. We've seen that most recently in uh, Bahrain. It had been uh, with much more uh, truth, uh, the case in Lebanon, and is often um, trolled out wherever you see Shia populations um, advancing themselves politically, largely because traditionally Shia populations have been considered the political underclass in the Arab world. And that's a whole lecture in itself. But just to give you a flavour of how issues go. So we see in 1979, the Iranian Revolution, which put into power a Shia government, a Shia Persian government, but, but provided an exemplar to other Shia uh, communities in the region that it was possible to attain political power. Followed very swiftly thereafter by the counterstroke from the Sunni Arab world, 
uh, for the Gulf War from 1980 to 1988. In 2000, the Israeli withdrawal from Lebanon, which was uh, nearly totally the result of action on the part of Hezbollah, a Shia uh, Arab party and militia. By 2004, King Abdullah of Jordan is warning of a Shia crescent going across the Middle East. In 2005, uh, the first Shia majority government came to power in Iraq, so removed the Arab, traditional Arab buffer state between Shia Persia and Sunni, largely Sunni Arab interests. And the next year, President Hosni Mubarak, during an interview, warned that Shia are only ever loyal to Iran ultimately. And now in 2011, last year, we saw uh, a pro-Shia government come power in Lebanon. Now, all of these counterstrokes by uh, Sunni commentators, by Sunni uh, leaders, disregard the fact that it is possible for you to be um, a Shia nationalist. You can aspire to greater uh, political power for your community within your country and have good relations with Iran not so good relationships with Iran, or have close relationships with Iran. Political expression that has a religious feel to it can be purely nationalist. And in, I would argue in most of those cases, is entirely nationalist. Because the first opportunity for these Shia communities to attain political power. Which comes to the question of what are the real Iranian intentions? At the macro level, we've talked about the notion of a nuclearised Iran, which I believe most of you heard last week. And the question then becomes, if uh, Iran is able to acquire a nuclear power, for what purposes are they seeking to acquire it? Is it as a sword, to be used offensively, to assert their power, to gain regional dominance, because nobody else in the region, less Israel, has it? Or is it as a shield? It's a purely defensive measure because their conventional military forces are so weak, they've been invaded in the past and they feel a little threat. So is it a sword, is it a shield? You can mount strong arguments for both. Iranians will tell you that uh, Israel was invaded three times before it had nuclear capability, has been invaded since. They look at Pakistan and India, where debilitating wars had preceded the acquisition of nuclear capability. They have pieces erupted or less along those borders. So why can't Iran help it? There's also that notion in the region that Iran would love to get back to that period in the uh, early to mid 70s, where it was, to a greater or lesser degree, at least in the Persian Gulf, uh, the regional guarantor of peace, a kind of Pax uh, Iranian. Um, the US being very weak, and after the Vietnam War, and no other being unwilling to expend forces in the region but need to guarantee the security of its oil supplies to a greater or less degree subcontracted out security in the region to the Shah's Iran, who did it uh, relatively effectively. And as you said before, it's that notion of a zero-sum game. Is any advantage accrued by Shia populations within the Arab world and automatically give entree to Iranian interests? Certainly, countries like Saudi Arabia would have you believe that is exactly what happens. Uh, Shia communities in those countries uh, would be the first to tell you that we are um, Lebanese first and Shia second. You can be an Irish American and nobody accuses you of putting Irish interests in front of American interests, so why doesn't that work for us as well? But we also need to look at Shia transnational links, which is something uh, I'd like to harp on about. Um, there are some um, not so, um, there are some similarities to a small degree, and I don't want to overemphasize them, between Catholic Church and Shia Islam. It just conceptually makes it easier to understand certain aspects of it. And I say to some people, you know, Shia transnational links is so, like saying there's Catholic transnational links. It's the nature of the religion. Uh, you have to have it. Same in Shiism. The basis of Shiism is a manja. A source of emulation, a person who is of such 
religious understanding that they understand what God desires and they can give religious opinions or fatwa which you need to follow. In Shia Islam, if you're an observant Shia, you need to follow a martyr. Now sometimes in Shia history, there is a single martyr. There is one person who is preeminent. More often, there's several. Sometimes we half a dozen, sometimes we two or three. Um, and they can have differing opinions. Uh, Ayatollah Khomeini on the left uh, was probably one of two, but was highly politicized. And his view of the world was that the most highly qualified religious leader in the Shia world should also be the political leader. Ayatollah Ali Sistani on the right is of the quietest tradition, which is the other side of Shiism that um, Maraja would say, I look purely at, as far as is possible, <coughs> spiritual issues. And you should stay out of the temple. You should stay out of political life. That's obviously impossible. So you choose your fatwas very, very selectively. On social issues, you can give fatwa after fatwa. Um, on issues that have a political outcome, you are very careful. Ayatollah Sistani, uh, prior to the 2005 election in uh, Iraq, told made a fatwa that it was all observant Shia's responsibility to vote in the election, understanding that that would um, give best advantage for Shia politicians to be elected and ultimately a Shia government to evolve. It took a long time to deliberate over that because that was stepping firmly, fairly and squarely into the political realm, but he did it for the benefit of the community. Now currently, Ayatollah Sistani is probably um, probably the preeminent manager, but he is in his 80s. Uh, it is unlikely that there will be a single manager after him. There are a number. Now, how you decide to follow a manager can be any number of reasons. There was a Lebanese um, manager, Ayatollah Fadlallah. Some of you may know he died last year or the year before. If you're Lebanese, you understand what Ayatollah Fadlallah is talking about. You will tend to follow Ayatollah Fadlallah, because you're Lebanese. Most Shia Muslims in Australia, if you're of Lebanese descent, will follow him. He gave religious opinions about very earthy social issues. But if you're an observant Shia who is much better understanding of the religion, you can shock. You can say, I follow uh, Ayatollah Khamenei for his political guidance, but on spiritual issues or social issues, I follow Sistani's or you could follow Sistani for a period of time and think, I don't actually agree with him anymore, I'll follow another one. So it's quite a flexible religion. So that's where it, uh, it departs from Catholicism. There's no notion of a single pope where everything comes down. There can be several popes. And why I say that it follows on the Hausa and the Khuz. On the left is uh, Najaf in Iraq, on the right is Qum in Iraq. To uh, complete your religious education, you can have low-level um, clerics and you train and are educated for a number of years in a country where there are houses, so schools of learning in your own country. If you're very serious about your religion and you want to rise to the highest ranks of Shia Islam, you would either go to Najaf or Qum. That has a lot um, to do with how you view life. Obviously, Iranians would love everybody to go to Qum preeminent centre of Shia Islamic learning. Najaf has a much deeper and more varied history than Qum. Uh, so people would normally like to go to Najaf, uh, the depth of learning that Najaf offers. So your relations with, if you're Shia, Islam, uh, Shia Muslim, your relations with Iran or Iraq are natural. Um, a lot of the shrine sites that you would visit are in Iraq. Two major shrine sites are in Iran. If you're an observant Muslim, you would go to Iran or Iraq on pilgrimage, or both. Now, the notion of the Qums, and I throw this in, one of the other issues, if you're an observant Shia Muslim, as opposed to a Sunni, is the person that you follow, so the Marja that you follow. If you're an observant Muslim, the Qums is the fifth. So 20% of your Your personal profit 
at the end of the year is remitted to the manager that you follow. It's taking away all your living expenses. What your living expenses are up to you. If you want to live in a Humpty and you have a lot left over at the end of the year, you can remit 20% of the lot. If you want to drive a Ferrari and live in a flash house and you think, I have that much left over, you remit 20% of that. Nobody keeps track. But there is a massive flow of coins. So that's on top of the um, Zucker and the two and a half percent that was on to pay, this 20% is on top of that. We would understand that wealthy Shia, particularly in a place like West Africa, have lots of disposable income. There is a significant money flow to the Marja. Marja can't be everywhere at all times. He appoints wakils or representatives in each large Shia community who are deputised to collect the funds. He has a contractual obligation with the Marja and he can spend a percentage on areas that he feels the marriage would like spent on in his area. So these massive transnational links of money flows from West Africa, from Gulf, from Lebanon, across to Iraq, to Iran, some of which is remitted, some of which is kept in those countries, are purely religious. They are used oftentimes as cash transactions, oftentimes cash transactions to Qum, cash transactions to Najaf, has transactions all over the Middle East. That's a natural flow uh, if you're an observer of Shia Muslim. Now the other issue is uh, ethnic issues. And I say Baharana Hasawiya versus Hajjah. <laughs> this area up here, so the East Province of Saudi Arabia, uh, the Al Asa. Uh, so if you're from there, you might live in one of your ancestors, they came from here, sometimes called Hasawiya. Or if you're from here, up to southern Iraq, that area is sometimes referred to as the Baharana. So, and if you're Ajam, Ajam is Arabic for Persia. So you're, if you're Ajami, you come from Persian background. So like Irish Americans, you can be an Ajami, or you can be a Baharana or Hasawiya. So if you're in, um, uh, Bahrain, for instance, about a third of the population, Shia population, are uh, Ajami. So your families came from Persia, two thirds came from uh, from Iraq, down around Saudi Arabia. You will oftentimes still marry across in the Persian families that you've been married marrying into for hundreds of years. If you are in Kuwait, you might be marrying into southern Iraqi families which you have for hundreds of years. It's the natural way of Shia community. So again, transnational links between uh, the Arab Peninsula and Iran amongst the Shia community, the natural events. And as I mentioned before, I think in the uh, 16th, 16th century in Safavid, Iran, the rulers decided to change from Sunni Islam as a control measure to uh, Shia Islam. To go from, to uh, get the population from Sunni Islam to Shia Islam takes a lot of people to educate the new population and to educate the educators in the future. Those people came from uh, southern Iraq, those people came from southern Lebanon, which at that stage, and the Bakar Valley, which at that stage in the 1500s were centres of Shia learning, and Bahrain, which is another centre of Shia learning. Lots of those families have stayed, elements of those families have stayed in Iraq to this day, but again, those families still intermarry between uh, Ajami families from southern Lebanon or the Bakar married into Persian families quite regularly. And I'll skip through the few eight one, I know we're getting short on time. The last one, uh, which is probably a bit more uh, meaningful, in 1980, uh, Saddam Hussein prescribed a dollar, which was a Shia uh, political party in southern uh, Iraq, centered around Najaf, who started by clerics that sought politicization of the Shia. Prescribed party, if you're a member of that party, you were executed and expelled all the foreign students from Najaf. Now, if you were a serious student in 1980 and you couldn't study in Iraq, there was one, you could either stop your studies or you could go across the border to Qum. So lots of foreign students went to the only place they could study, which was Qum. Lots of members of the Adawa party, who they'd stayed in Iraq, would have been killed. Iran 
offered them sanctuary. So the current Prime Minister of uh, Iraq was a member of a Dawa, who spent some period of time in Iraq in 1980. Now once they got to Iran, one of two things happened. Yeah, the Iranians tried to turn them into um, um, pro-Iranian uh, Adawa members, and half the party split as a result. The other half of the party didn't want to be that close to the Iranians, and they tended to go to a place like Syria or Europe. Again, the current Prime Minister of Iraq was one of those. So again, these people owe a debt of gratitude to Iran for saving their lives, but they certainly don't want to be and not with the same political view as Iran, because they made the choice, or they understood that they were being encouraged to go that way and they made a choice to leave. So a debt of gratitude, but it's not the same as following the political part. I'll hurry up here. Okay, so this last one. Um, I know it's been a big grab bag, but it was mainly to engender some discussion. Um, and I covered that before. Uncertain intent. If Iran is uh, its intent in terms of, uh, not only in terms of uh, nuclear capability, but in terms of being a regional hegemon, um, you don't need to count planes or tanks. Um, you need to look at the capabilities. Capabilities are not pieces of equipment. It's how you use those tanks, how modern those tanks are, how well serviced those tanks are, can aircraft be vectored onto other aircraft. Your army is two, -thir two thirds conscripts, so the levels of training are low. Collective training, joint training, not very good at all. So while it might look aggressive on paper, and might be okay in an offensive um, capability, certainly provides no offensive capability. What happens if uh, Syria um, goes under? Um, I think we're both in agreement that um, we don't think it will at the moment, but um, it's a pivotal state for uh, Iranian interests in the region. If it goes under, uh, in my opinion, it won't be terminal for Iran. There's many other ways to uh, ship weapons to Hezbollah. Uh, and in some ways, it might redouble Iranian efforts to get closer to Iraqi political parties and closer, even closer to Lebanese political parties. So there'll be a way of naturally matching up. And that having been said, not everything is competitive. Maritime boundaries, where money is concerned, relations are pretty good still. Uh, Oman has always been the messenger between uh, the Arab world and uh, always, but recently it's been the messenger between the Arab world uh, and Iran, and oftentimes the West and Iran. Oman has significant joint ventures, particularly in gas with Iran, and countries like Kuwait and Qatar um, have joint maritime boundaries that have gas fields that need to be jointly uh, explored and exploited, and relations between the, those countries are good, purely economic reasons. And finally, um, Iran's ability, uh, while sanctions have had a significant uh, impact on Iran, they are quite good at getting around their well practiced over a decade of getting around sanctions. And we can see now at the moment that there's preferential treatment for the additional sanction infused NICs. India in particular, last week a large trade delegation uh, went over and they're looking at doubling the trade with Iran uh, over the next, uh, up until 2015. So there's always ways to get around it and the, Iranian, uh, the Indian Trade Minister is pretty blatant about saying it that um, the sanctions are a good um, business opportunity for Iranian exporters, uh, why wouldn't you? So uh, I think Iran is particularly good about getting around these sanctions, but there is no doubt that it's having a deleterious effect back home. So probably just, hopefully the one thing, two things you've got out of this. You've got to, when people say there are links between Iran and other countries, you really have to look at what links are talk, you are talking about. There's naturally occurring links that have been there for hundreds of years. There's no nefarious purpose for those links. There are other links that are there for nefarious purposes. So the trick for every analyst is to work out what are we talking about. A, a link to uh, extend your influence, or a link because it has to encourage you the nature of religion and nature of history in that together. Okay, no less there.